Hello, fellow foodies. Welcome back. This is Cassandra Quaid, your host for Foodie Pharmacology. So today I have a question for you. What if we could discover new medical treatments based on how animals use nature as medicine? This practice of animal self-medication is called zoopharmacognosy. That's a big word, but we're going to dive into what it actually means on this episode. You may actually be surprised by just how many different types of animals can self-medicate. And here's a clue. It's not just limited to primates, but also includes many other mammals and even insects. Our guest today, who's going to guide us deeper into the subject, is Dr. Yop Derude. He is a Samuel Candler Dobbs Professor of Biology at Emory University. Yop completed his PhD in Evolution and Ecology at the University of Edinburgh. Prior to joining the faculty at Emory in 2008, he held postdoctoral positions at Emory and the University of Georgia. His primary research focus is the ecology and evolution of host parasite interactions, including the study of self-medication in monarch butterflies, virulence evolution in honeybee parasites, and drug resistance in human malaria. In 2011, he was elected by Popular Science Magazine as part of their yearly roundup of the most promising scientists in the U.S. under 40. Derude teaches introductory biology, ecology, evolution, and insect biology, and he was named an Emory Williams Distinguished Teaching Award recipient in 2017. He is currently writing a popular science book on how animals use medicine and what we can learn from them. So it's great to see you today, Yop. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so let's start with the basics. Can you break down for us what this this field of zoo pharmacognosy is all about? It's, it's such a big word, it's a little bit intimidating, so maybe you can make it a little bit simpler for us. Yeah, absolutely, and I actually don't like using the word myself because it's such a tongue twister. And I really think of it as animal medication. That's generally how I refer to the whole subject. As you notice, I just said animal medication or animal self-medication. And that's mm-hmm. because we have learned over the last few decades that when animals use medicine, it's not always to medicate themselves, but they can use it to treat others, such as their kin, their offspring, and or other members of the social groups they live in. So what it really comes down to is that animals use different forms of medication. And really most of what we're talking about is kind of using chemicals or plants, compounds from plants or other animals that animals use against a lot of different things. And a lot of us focus on specifically infectious diseases caused by parasites and pathogens. So in some ways you could really think of it as the use of drugs against parasitic diseases. That's the most common form of animal medication. That's a great, that's great. And so I know that for some of the earliest studies in this field were based on non-human primates. And Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Like, how did how did this field emerge as a field of science, and how did all that get started? Yeah, so I think a lot of it really started, like you said, with non-human primates, specifically chimpanzees. And so when we go back to the early 1980s, there were different studies done by different people, and it really started with observations. Primatologists studying chimpanzees are really wonderful experts who follow chimpanzees, know them by name, know their age, and have been spending so much time with their study objects, the chimpanzees, in the forest that they notice when something is different from what they have seen before. And there were several observations. Some some of the ones I know best are done by Michael Huffman, who works at Kyoto University in, in Japan. And when he was tracking his chimpanzees, he noticed that one of the chimpanzees seemed like she was sick. Her name was Chao Siku. She seemed really kind of off, lethargic, had kind of symptoms of not feeling good, and started eating a plant that he had never seen chimpanzees eat before. Now, the wonderful thing was that he was accompanied by a a local um, healer, a traditional healer who also helped him trek in the forest and was also working there with the wildlife services. And what happened is that this person recognized the plant, his name was Saifu Kolumde, and he recognized the plant. He said, oh, that's a plant that we use for medicinal purposes when we have diarrhea or stomach upset and things such, such as that. And so what they decided is to really watch this chimpanzee. And they saw this chimpanzee really take the branches of the plant and then uh, remove all the outer parts, really go to the inside, 
bite it into little pieces and then really suck it. And this is a, a plant called Vernonia, very, very toxic, very, very bitter. It's also bitter leaf, that's the name in English. And so when they were seeing that, it, it really struck him that this chimpanzee was doing this, apparently not feeling good, eating a plant that is used by local people as a medicinal plant. And then they decided to track this chimpanzee and, and saw that she recovered within about 24 hours, which is exactly the same amount of time that the traditional healers um, you know, used to see if, if, if the disease has, has subsided. So that was one example. Other researchers, including Richard Rangham, they were looking at other um, chimpanzees and noticed that chimpanzees sometimes take the leaves of plants and instead of chewing them and eating them, they fold them over, put them in their mouth and then swallow them. And when they do that, it doesn't seem like a very pleasant experience. The chimpanzees don't like what they're doing. But it's really curious when, when you see chimpanzees do that because they don't eat the plants, they're swallowing the whole leaves completely. And for a while, they, they thought it was because there was chemicals in these plants that, that may be bad for parasitic worms. It turned out after a lot of different studies that actually the leaves that they use are very hairy. They have a lot of trichomes, the little hairs that a lot of plant leaves contain. And um, so they started coining it the Velcro effect, where these leaves could actually capture parasitic worms in the gut and thereby expel them, um, you know, within the next hours or within a day or so. And so those were really the first observations where primatologists really saw something that wasn't the normal feeding behavior that they witnessed. They really tied this together with disease symptoms and they tied it together with clearance or recovery within a certain amount of time. And that was really the first observational evidence that animals may be using medication. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I often get questioned about, you know, where did humans learn how to use all of these different medicinal plants and their different traditional system of medicine? And, you know, what I've noted is that people living in these natural ecosystems are often really good you know, observers of nature. And so it makes me wonder, like going back centuries, if not millennia, um, did humans actually learn how to use some of these plants from observing animals like non-human primates? Um, maybe that plays a role in the origin of our medicine. That really seems to be the case. And so to go back to Saifu Kalunde that I just mentioned as a traditional healer that accompanied Michael Huffman tracking the chimpanzees in the forest, he really told Huffman at the time that a lot of the traditional medicines that they use are based on witnessing animals. And so he came from a long line of traditional healers. And in that line of healers, people had really looked at animals, for example, porcupine. So one of the stories there was that there was a porcupine with bloody diarrhea and uh, the healer was following the porcupine. So it dig up a particular root that it normally doesn't eat and then recover it from it. And then started using that root. Um, the healer started using that root and started experimenting with it. And that's now a widely established medicine within that area to treat bloody diarrhea. There are other examples of healers looking at elephants where elephants may use particular plants when they have stomach upset and they basically make a concoction in their mouth. They take the leaf, they mix it with water and then swallow it. And that has become a well-established tra traditional healing practice for stomach upset in Tanzania. So you see a lot of these examples. I mean, when you dig deeper, it's actually very clear when you look at Native Americans here in North America, uh, pretty much every Native American um, tribe has particular herbs, particular medicines that they call bear medicine or bear berry. And it's very clear when you, when you look at the anthropological surveys that have been done in conversations when the traditional healers um, really talk about how they learn about medicine that they, that they say, yes, we have learned from bears and bears are really the master of medicine and we, we can learn these things from bears. Bears are the only animals that really dig up roots here in North America. And then when you, when you look further along the whole Northern hemisphere, you see the same in Europe, you see the same in Asia. So bears have often been used as an example for finding out about particular medicinal substances, medicinal plants. And it's often still captured in the name where the, the word bear is, 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 is right there. It's in the name. Wow, that's, that's a really cool clue as to like the origins of things. You know, um, one of the big areas of debate in the history of medicine is on whether or not Neanderthals 
mm. used medicinal plants. And there's this cave site in northern Iraq. It's called the Shanadar site, where there are remnants of, of, of floral remnants, pollen. Um, but there's a lot of debate there over whether or not this was truly tied to the Neanderthal burial site or if it was just something that rodents brought in. Mm. It happens to be rich in plants that are still used today as traditional yeah. medicines in the region. So I was wondering, like, what are your thoughts on this, especially taking into consideration all that you know about animal um, medication? Yeah, so I, I have no doubt that Neanderthals use medication. And I think the study you just mentioned is a very indirect one where you say, well, we found particular evidence that these plants were in that area. That doesn't mean the Neanderthals actually used them. But there is a there is a more recent study that comes from the north of Spain where Neanderthal remains were found. And what they found there is looking at the teeth, you know, as we, we develop mm -hmm. plaque on our teeth and the bacteria basically die on our teeth and they start forming this calculus, a lot of different chemicals get captured in that calculus. And what researchers have done there is to analyze that do a chemical analysis of the calculus and found evidence that Neanderthals tens of thousands of years ago used yarrow and chamomile, which are two, mm. as you know, <laughs> very yes. common medicinal plants, but not used as food in any cultures as we know it. And mm. so really specifically used as medicinal plants all around, you know, where the places where these plants grow. And so I think that's stronger evidence that Neanderthals already used medicinal plants. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's so exciting when these new findings come out. Um, I was wondering how many how many different animals do we know about that medicate? I'm sure we've only scratched the surface, but you mentioned elephants, you mentioned chimpanzees. Um, what other types of animals are mm -hmm. do we know that self medicate? Yeah, we're, we're learning more and more. And maybe to go back to your initial question about the non-human primates where it was first discovered. And I, and I do want to make clear that when I say first discovered, we really talk about Western science discovering yeah. it, right? When I say, you know, the first reports are the 1980s. Of course, what we learn from traditional healers that they have looked at animals for thousands of years, at least. Yeah. So they may not have written it down in a, med in a medical or scientific journal. Yeah. So, but in terms of Western science, yeah, those, those primate studies were the first. And then since that time, we, there's really great evidence, really wonderful studies have been done on all sorts of animals that really show that a lot of different animals use it. And some of those may be surprising. You know, we, we talked about primates. Of course, humans like to think that we're very special and different. And so <laughs> we give some, you know, some credibility to animals that are very much like us, such as chimpanzees and bonobos and gorillas, we can live with that. But then you start saying, well, goats do it and sheep do it. And then mm -hmm. you find that fruit flies do it and woolly bear caterpillars do it and monarch butterflies and honeybees. And so we are now at a point where we're just learning more and more animals are using medication. Doesn't mean that they all do it, but I think the more we look, the more we will find. And I think we have maybe for a long time been kind of stimmied by the idea that it has to be animals that are like us, that have big brains like us. And that's partly based on the belief that you need higher cognitive processing to learn how to medicate. Um, and that just doesn't seem to be the case. It seems that animals such as insects or even cats, when you think about cats using catnip or silver vine and they roll around in these plants, they go crazy. They actually coat themselves in mosquito repellents and it protect them against not just the mosquito bites but also the horrible worms that mosquitoes transmit between them and but they don't know what they're doing right it doesn't involve higher cognitive processes a lot of these responses are innate we see innate responses in cats we see innate responses in caterpillars and so it doesn't really require you know an awareness of what these animals are doing and i think that's true even for chimpanzees, you know, the chimpanzee that is sick and uses a particular plant may not actually know what they're doing, but it is a response to how they're feeling. And over evolutionary time, they have evolved this behavior because it helps them, it makes them survive, and therefore they produce offspring that may have that same behavior. Yeah, I guess that's, that, that brings me to my next question. And it's really, is this simply an innate response, you know, that you were born with? to react to certain chemical signals in the environment or and especially when it comes to some of these higher animals i'm thinking also of dolphins there was an interesting study recently published on dolphins it's you know or is this a learned behavior um or is it some of both 
and, and maybe that depends on the on the kind of where they fall in the evolutionary tree of, of cognition. I, I don't know. Like, what can you tell us about that? Yeah. So I, th I think there's three ways. I think there is innate. And that is really, you know, behavioral ecologists or, you know, ethologists used to call this instinct. That's a term that's kind of gone out of vogue because we know that a lot of things that used to be instinctual, animals still have to practice and learn to, to optimize their behaviors. But when I look at a monarch butterfly and what we see in our research, monarch butterflies that are infected with a parasite, it's really quite detrimental to them. And that covers their whole abdomen with spores that they can transmit to the plants that they lay their eggs on and to the caterpillars that will come out of those eggs. We see that these monarch butterflies can ch change their preference for what plants they use to lay their eggs on. And they choose plants that are more toxic that reduce the infection in their offspring. But these monarchs have no way of learning this because by the time they have laid their egg, they're off and it's their offspring that will reap the benefit of that behavior. To me, that is very much an innate behavior where you have a monarch that's infected, the physiology changes, it has more attracted to a more toxic plant, lays more of its eggs on there. So I think that's really how, how, how we have to think about that. But I just mentioned the catnip response, you know, cats go crazy over catnip and that seems to be very innate as well. It's not a learned behavior, cats just do it. Um, some of them don't, but most of them do. Um, so I don't think it matters, you know, where, whether animals are, you know, what we used to think of are more or less evolved. Of course, when we think about an evolutionary tree, you know, monarch butterflies have evolved just as long as we have from our most common, re uh, most recent common ancestor. Um, but yeah, it doesn't all have to be innate. There's individual learning. So individual learning has been uh, really nicely demonstrated in studies on goats and sheep. So there have been wonderful studies uh, done by, by Fred Provence and Juan Villalba there at um, um, Utah State University have done decades worth of really wonderful work where they can actually see that animals learn from their experiences. And a great example is that particular plants that are really high in tannins. So chemicals mm -hmm. that, that can cause a lot of stomach upset. These animals really try to avoid eating them, um, but, it, but it takes some time to develop that. And the reason for that is they, they will eat some plants that have a lot of tannins, then they start feeling sick afterwards. And then the next day they may avoid that plant. When they're infected, however, um, they feel much worse and they learn that those particular plants are actually good because then when they eat them, they, they experience a relief of the symptoms and they start eating the plants more. So that's really individual learning, um, associative learning where these animals associate particular symptoms with what they ate. You can also trick animals um, because you can, you know, wonderful experiments have been done to actually feed them particular things and, and, and couple it with chemicals. So they start associating things that should be good for them with, with bad effects, but that's really to show that they can do this associative learning. So that individual learning is really important in a lot of animals. And then on top of that, there is social learning. So animals can mm -hmm. learn from each other. This has been shown in rats and it's been shown in sheep as well. When these animals are with their mothers, they're much more likely to develop and learn these behaviors, these medication behaviors than when they are on their own. Um, and and that's, that's partly because of copying behavior, but it seems also that a really big aspect of that is that animals lose some of their neophobia. So animals are actually very conservative in what they eat. And so to change their diet when they're sick, that, that's a big threshold to, to get over yeah. that. But when they're with their mothers or other individuals in a social group, they're much more likely to overcome that threshold. And so that social aspect is really important. And so, and this may also be important in the, the chimpanzees that, that we mentioned. Um, and interestingly, you know, you think about how, how does a chimpanzee know whether to fold the leaf? Um, does it only do that when it's sick? It seems when you look at captive populations of chimpanzees in zoos, you give them these plants that are hairy and, and they start folding them, but they do it in different ways. So there's also a really interesting aspect of culture where different groups of chimpanzees will fold the leaves in different ways. And then, you know, the next step would be when they're infected, they're going to use it more. And then they start learning to associate that behavior with the relief of symptoms. So they'll do it again next time they feel sick. So there is innate, there's individual learning, there's social learning. And that, yeah, 
different animals use different combinations of those three aspects. That's fascinating. Well, and in your, your own work, you've really undertaken groundbreaking work with monarch butterflies. And I wonder if we could dive a little bit deeper into that. How did you get interested in monarchs and kind of what is the study of butterflies? What is, what is, how does that contribute to the bigger picture of issues like mm -hmm. malaria, which I know you're also interested in? I really got into monarch butterflies because they become sick. And that's always surprising to people because we think of humans getting sick and you know we think of our pets getting sick. That's why we go to the vet. But a lot of people don't understand or, or realize or think of a daily basis that wild animals get sick as well. And especially when you think about insects and so on. But yes, so insects get sick as well. I actually did my PhD research on malaria and I studied malaria mostly in, in rodents that were not necessarily the natural hosts of the parasites. I wanted to study a parasite in its natural habitat where I could do field studies and lab experiments. And I found that monarch butterflies have a protozoan parasite that's actually quite related to the parasite that causes malaria in humans. So for me, it was, you know, sticking to the parasites, but changing the host. And the host happened to be a beautiful, brightly colored uh, butterfly that also migrates to Mexico. So it's one of the most famous butterfly species in the world. And um, so I really wanted to, to study the parasites. And then, then looking at the parasites in monarch butterflies, it's clear that monarchs use milkweeds as their larval food plants. So their larvae, their caterpillars, are specialized on milkweeds. That's the only plants they can eat. But there are different species of milkweeds that monarchs can use. And those species vary a lot in their toxicity. So some milkweeds are extremely toxic. You know, if, if we take a few leaves, we, we, would, we would die. Yeah. Um, caterpillars, uh, monarch caterpillars don't die. They have evolved a level of tolerance to the toxins in the, in the milkweeds. And these toxins are, are called cardenolites. We also know them as heart poisons. So if we have too many, our heart stops. And um, so... You know, looking at this interaction, you have, you have the butterfly, you have the parasite, and then you have these plants that vary in these toxic chemicals. It was just a wonderful opportunity to see how these plants mediate the disease, the infection of the parasite, and the disease symptoms in monarch butterflies. So the research we did, we found that these more toxic milkweeds make the monarchs less sick with the parasites. And then the natural question was to ask whether monarchs can take advantage of that and use the more medicinal plants when they are infected. And what was interesting at that point was that the caterpillars do not actually make choices once they're infected. And it kind of makes sense because it's the mothers that put eggs on plants and the caterpillars kind of stuck on that milkweed. You know, mother made the choice, caterpillar is stuck there, doesn't really get to choose much. But these butterflies, adult butterflies, the females that lay eggs, they can fly all around, visit multiple different areas, different patches of milkweed and choose between plants. And you often see them go to the plant and they inspect it and then they fly off or they lay an egg. And so then our experiments with adult females showed that when you give them a choice between more medicinal, less medicinal plants, they lay more of their eggs on the more medicinal plants. And that then reduces infection in their offspring and makes their offspring caterpillars less sick. So it's really, you know, we, we like to call it mommy knows best. It's really the, the mothers doing the medication for the, for the offspring. Um, but, you know, and, and then you ask, you know, what, what can we learn from it for you know, when you think about what are parallels with malaria and other things? Well, in some ways, I think not necessarily in this system, but there's always this idea. If you look at animals such as butterflies and you find how they're dealing with their infectious diseases, with their parasites and pathogens, and they use these medicinal plants, can we find out what those medicines are? Can we use them for our own parasites? For example, the cardenolites, are they killing the parasite in monarchs? If that's the case, maybe they could kill malaria parasites too. Of course, they can kill us too at the right dose, so you have to be very yeah. careful. But I think what, what our research um, has done is kind of opened up the realm of possibilities to say, hey, it doesn't have to be primates. It doesn't even have to be vertebrates with big brains. It can be insects with tiny little brains, right? Because monarchs have tiny little brains. And you know, if an animal like that can do medication, we can start looking more broadly. We can move beyond the bears and the chimpanzees and, and, and the elephants and see what can insects teach us about medicine and can they actually point us in the right direction for discovering new medicines um, from all these natural plants that they're using. Yeah, that's such a great point. And 
as, as you're speaking, I was wondering, you know, how many of these of these plants that are used in animal medication also happen to have a, a similar use in human medication. It seems like there are quite a few that yes. where there is some crossover. There's yeah. so much overlap, yes. Yeah. And going back to the to the dolphin story, that was a recent publication um, where they looked at dolphin behavior. I think they were rubbing up against certain types of corals. Um, yeah and there might be some antimicrobial or anti-infective properties there. I mean, I think that's really cool too, because even in marine environments, you, you know, it's this kind of behavior is not limited just to plants. It's limited to, you know, it expands to other organisms that may be sources of, of, of uh, powerful medical compounds. Absolutely. I mean, we haven't looked at marine environments very much. There are great examples of, of the use of chemicals of, of animals. So you have, different types of monkeys that will actually um, find the millipedes. Millipedes have all these wonderful um, poisons that they use to protect themselves. And what, what monkeys can do is grab these millipedes and then bite them and they break them and they start rubbing their whole body and they go in this frenzy, um, but it protects them against mosquitoes. So that's an example of animals using the chemicals produced by another animal instead of a plant as a form of protection against parasites. The dolphin example is interesting because that looks at the marine environment and there are very few studies like that. And so these dolphins, they like rubbing themselves on, on, on sponges as well. And chemical analysis shows that these sponges have a lot of antimicrobial compounds. Um, you know, so that's very, it's very intriguing. You know, with, with that study, we're not there yet to really understand what, what, the, what the dolphins are doing. Are they really doing it as a form of medication? or are they just having fun or are they itching? You know, th those are alternative um, explanations. Yeah. And that's really something, you know, and, and that's again, why I went back to the 1980s. I said, you know, that with those first studies on chimpanzees that were very well reported, it was really putting the whole puzzle together. So we see the chimpanzee do something that it normally doesn't do. We find out it's sick and we know that when it does this, it gets better. Right, and th those are really all the different aspects you need to do. With insects, that's easy because insects you can rear in a lab, you can rear them at large numbers, you can really do very controlled experiments. Chimpanzees, not so much, with dolphins, also not so much. But so one of the things we still, the researchers still need to find out for the dolphins is, do they do this specifically when they're sick? Um, if they are sick or if they have skin infections, does it really help? You know, those are some of the open questions that the researchers are looking into. So for now, it's an observation that may be medication um, based on a lot of other examples we have that probably is medication, but we need more studies to really determine that it is. Yeah, that's great. It's, it's amazing. I mean, it, all of this kind of falls under the domain of of chemical ecology, right? Mm -hmm. When you're you're an ecologist, evolutionary biologist, um, when you think about chemical ecology and signaling between organisms, I think it's easy as humans to sometimes forget that in organisms that we can't verbalize with, you know, um, that they're actually signaling and communicating with each other constantly. Mm -hmm. And this goes even to plants and fungi mm -hmm. are communicating with each other, with other organisms in the environment and the soil, you know, and, and above ground as well. Um, where do you think, I guess one question is, how, how are animals placed at risk with factors such as climate change? Because this is something we, we discuss a lot in the field of medical ethnobotany, you know, we have over 34,000 species of plants used by humans in some form of medicine. Mm -hmm. And yet two in five plant species are threatened with risks of extinction. Yeah. And so many of these plants that are critical to human you know, systems of medicine are under threat. And I'm wondering, is this, is this another kind of threat that's not really being discussed? I mean, are we, as we lose these habitats, animals might be losing access to food resources, but are their medicines also at risk? I mean, this is something I've just never really seen explored very much in the literature. Absolutely. I think that's a really important aspect. When we think of conservation, we often think of, of habitat or food, you know, we need to maintain their food. You know, when, when I think about monarch butterflies, a lot of people talk about conservation for monarchs. What does that involve? Well, they need milkweeds as food for the caterpillars and they need flowers to provide nectar for the butterflies. But no one talks about 
um, preserving their medicine. And I think this is true for so many pollinators and so many herbivores in general, so many animals that use all sorts of different plants. We need to really think about not just what they do when they're healthy, but what they do when they get sick. And the stresses that they're going to experience are only going to get worse with, you know, the, the climate change and changing changes in humidity and temperature and droughts and flooding and all sorts of things. Um, you know, if humans are any example, I think that animals are going to have a lot more stresses and probably going to suffer a lot more disease um, in, in the decades to come. And so we really have to think about preserving those whole habitats and not just thinking about, oh, as long as they have their food, it's good enough. It's not. It's just like, you know, yeah. if, if we go traveling, you know, and we say we're going to go on a month trek in the jungle, we're not just going to bring food. We're taking all sorts of medicines with us, right? And animals need that too. Yeah, oh, that's such a great point. That's such a great point. Well, I know um, you're currently working on this really exciting book project, which I am eagerly waiting to read. What can you share with us about it? I know it's it's still not out yet, um, but we're going to keep an eye out on it when it does come out. I'm um, going to let audience um, members know about it. But what can you share with us about that process and kind of what are some of the most interesting or intriguing things you've come across in your research as you're as you're working on this on this new book yeah so you're you're right it's not out it's not even done yet so <laughs> <laughs> we're working on it uh, as we speak um, and it's really a, a science book for a general reader about animals using medication and what we can learn from them so a lot of the things that we have just discussed are really part of that book and I'm really trying to really make it make it fun and and amazing right so part of the goal of the book is to just say hey nature is just so amazing and here's a whole aspect that we just don't tend to think about think about you know all these animals they do all this wonderful behavior that helps them against their infectious diseases that's just really wonderful that's one aspect of it another aspect of it is to really portray the scientists that do the work so the way i'm writing it is is not just summing up you know this animal does that that animal does that but how did researchers get into this you know how did they find this out what what did it take did were they met with skepsis when they published their findings and they're really trying to cover a lot of different people from different places around the world also to show that anyone can do this right and if you have to drive and the enthusiasm there is a place for you within this really developing field and so that can be established primatologists or it can be undergraduate students in Japan. So that's really one of the things I really try to, to make clear with that. And then what I'm hoping to do with it ultimately is that it all comes back to what you just mentioned. It comes back to biodiversity. You cannot medicate unless there is choices. You cannot change your diet unless you have choices. And so it's also really a call to arms in a way to say, let's preserve what we have, not just for the animals, you know, which is frankly enough for me, but also because we can learn from them, we can benefit from them. You know, there are so many resources out there and, and you notice from your own work, you know, it's it, there are so many medicines out there that we just haven't explored or we haven't even found yet. And animals have been finding them for millions of years. So let's see what they're doing. Let's see what they have found. Let's see if we can use it too. So those are all different aspects of the of the work. And um, yeah, so what's been most surprising? I think the the thing that keeps on coming up in all of the, the stories that I'm trying to interweave in the book is that people just simply didn't believe that any animal could mm -hmm. do this. And, you know, you start with the chimpanzees back in the 1980s, um, when Michael Huffman came up with this idea that it may be medication, colleagues would say, there is no way, you know. First of all, chimpanzees don't get sick. And second, there is no way they can do this or know how to do this, right? We saw the same with the monarch butterflies. When we tried to publish the findings, you know, people say, there's no way an insect can do this. And then, you know, then I, I went to Mexico City to, to meet researchers at the university campus there where they have done wonderful studies to see how house finches and sparrows can use cigarette butts and they line their nests with cigarette butts and it keeps away all sorts of parasites and ticks and mites. And again, you know, and they actually went into it saying, there's no way, you know, even so you even see that scientists go into this and say, there's no way my animals do this. But then you find out 
there is a way they're doing it and then you you build these stories you do your experiments study after study trying to persuade yourself that these animals are actually pretty clever if you can use yeah. the word but they they actually um, really are good at, at doing this medication but it's a really recurrent theme that everyone i talk to say like, there's no way and it's like <laughs> and you know i talk to bee researchers and and you know they do experiments to see when they the colonies of honeybees are infected with pathogens and they start collecting more resin which is the sticky stuff on trees and mm -hmm. it is antimicrobial and antiparasitic and you know they do the experiment they find the bees collect more when there's more parasites and they say there's no way i'm going to do it again because i just don't believe it myself so it's it's uh it's really interesting so that's great i mean that's i think that's where all paradigm shifting work starts is there's there's no way this can be but then study after study after study shows well actually yeah able to build that evidence for it yeah that's fascinating great well, I guess my last question, Yop, is, you know, for all of the those out in the audience, we have a lot of graduate students that follow the show um, and other students at, at various levels of, of their training, just interested people. So um, I guess if my question is two part. If you are interested in, for example, um, citizen science and you want to contribute in some way towards monarch preservation, mm -hmm. what are some steps they can take or what are some other steps that they may be able to take to help with making observations of, of animal medication? Like what, what kind of guidance can you give them? Certainly in terms of conservation, I think the most important thing is to maintaining and recreating natural habitat. So what I don't believe in, in monarch butterflies, for example, is to rear large numbers indoors and then let them go. We actually have seen that that can increase parasite prevalence because the parasites can do so well in these enclosed environments and then you let them go and you actually make things worse. So recreating habitat, but that also means really being aware of what plants do well in the area that you live in. And, you know, we have a challenge in monarch butterflies that Pretty much the only milkweed that you can buy in commercial places is a non-native tropical milkweed it's beautiful but it's not it's not native and the problem is when when you buy that it doesn't really die very quickly in the winter it builds up parasites it takes monarchs out of their migration so a lot of issues with that so really thinking hard about recreating that habitat one thing that i've really become very interested in is this idea of replacing green lawns with natural habitat and there yeah. are a lot of a lot of initiatives actually a lot of different states and a lot of different countries um i i just read this morning actually that uh, that that green lawns that that people have in their front yards take up they're the biggest crop in the in the u.s they're actually bigger than than corn yeah. so they're which is quite impressive and we don't you think of our lawns it. in that way, but you're right. It's like grass is a exactly. one of our biggest crops. <laughs> yeah, and they're, and they're, and they're grasses that are not native and they mm -hmm. require pesticides and fertilization and enough water that, that fills millions of Olympic sized swimming pools on a yearly basis. So thinking even about replacing 10% of that lawn with native plants that support all sorts of insects and other wildlife, mm -hmm. I think that's really the way to go for the, for the monarch butterflies. That's great. And, you know, folks can learn about, you know, native plants or native plant societies in different states. Um, we have ag extension services through your um, different state universities, land grant institutions, where you can get resources yeah. on that. Yeah. And and when it comes to, to students that are either interested in graduate school or in graduate school and are intrigued by this field of animal medication, um, what kind of advice can you give them? And, is there a particular area of, of science that they should really focus in, or are there multiple disciplines that can be um, used in, in, in this kind of research? It's really multiple disciplines. There is no such thing as a study in animal medication. <laughs> and when you look at, and, and that's the other thing that I'm trying to do with my book is really to show the diversity of backgrounds that people come from. So you have primatologists that really started off studying behavior of chimpanzee or chimpanzees or other primates there's people um you know i i mentioned that the birds in mexico city that's really urban ecology so really trying to understand how do animals adapt to urbanization and other human influences 
Um, my own work really comes from tritrophic interactions, with which we mean the plants and the herbivores and the, the enemies, in this case, parasites of those herbivores. So it's really a lot of different angles that, that people are coming from. So I think, you know, that the most important thing would be to have some interest in, in the animals and their, and their parasites. And you can address that in many different ways. Um, whether it's very basic ecology, evolutionary biology, or whether it is, um, you know, agriculture or food systems where, where they have those challenges too. So I think, yeah, my advice is, <laughs> I, I don't know what my advice is in that sense. It, it's more like, you know, go with what, what you find interesting and there will always be a way to find something out about animal medication within those systems. That's great. Yeah, I mean, you could even approach this, and I'm thinking from a biology perspective, from chemistry, ecology, anthropology even, because as you mentioned, yes. you know, traditional healers are, are very well acquainted with some of these animal behaviors, and these have not, you know, that's another element to traditional medicine that's not as well documented still um, in the literature. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much Yap, for coming on the show. This has been really great. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious recorded for you today on Restream. You can find this and all of our other episodes at foodiepharmacology.com. You can follow Dr. Giroud's work on his um, Twitter account at yop underscore de underscore rude. Um, and you can find our show on our social media platforms at Foodie Pharma. And lastly, I want to give a big shout out to thanks to our producers, to Rob and Christine of Co Conspiracy Entertainment for bringing a fabulous show to you each week. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there and I'll see you next time.